So hello, um, welcome uh, to my talk. I hope you guys know a little bit about Crystals. If not, you're in for a, definitely for a ride. I'm Carlos Rocha, I'm the CEO and founder of Dream Song Incorporated and C Games. Um, we develop very, very unique type of games. Um, and some of you are designers, uh, raise hands. Wonderful, we're gonna have a great time together. Okay, so this day is the design of Crystals classical gameplay through a new design crystal. That's a really bad pun for the innovative design that we have in this game. Uh, you probably have never seen something like this. And you can summarize it by saying you have to learn from the past, act in the present, and create your future. This is how we think everything around crystals, and this is how you're going to play the game. Um, and also see this presentation. Through this stained glass, you can see past, present, and future in the same screen, right? But sometimes you need to focus on only one. So let's focus first on the future. This is where we want to get to. And you probably have seen it already, seen so many tests, but this is the trailer that we actually presented during E3. So the announcement was at the PC gaming conference at E3 this year. Modus is our publisher. If you saw who it was, what is it? What would if you knew how it ends? And that's Chris Bell. Would you change it? Could you make the hard decisions? And would you be strong enough to fight? As you can see, it's heavily inspired by the RPGs of old and you can see past, present, and future at the same time. That's the main mechanic of the game and what we build around all of the systems in the game. It's gonna be out by 2020 on basically all platforms, PC, Xbox One, PS4, Switch, which is the fa everyone's favorite, and PC. Um, we won a lot of awards uh, during the Game Connection uh, event. We won a lot of awards also from a lot of uh, media venues. Uh, we got tons of coverage from uh, IGN, IGN Japan, Kotaku, Famitsu, Variety, Popular Mechanics. Um, even Famitsu uh, did um, a preview in the game. So people in Japan are really, really excited uh, about the game uh, also. And there's already a community being built. Uh, so there's tons of fun art. And we just have a demo on, on Steam uh, if you wanted to set out. Um, we're really happy how people have been receiving the game. Uh, it's really exciting for us to be creating something that uh, you know people are excited to play. But in order to actually get to a very well-selling game, we need to go, we need to know where we've been, and we need to learn from our past. So, this is our previous game. It's called Heimrich. As you can see, it's a completely different art style. Um, we try to develop games with very unique look and feels, uh, and it also has a very unique mechanic. That's what actually you know, makes us who we are. So you have sepia color and red. Uh, it's a very tongue-in-cheek type of humor. Uh, but the thing is, the main mechanic is that you actually walk on top of the story. So there's a door on top of the word door. And in order to open it, you have to grab a key from the word key. So you get burned if you get on top of the word fire. You can grab a crossbow from the word crossbow and start using it. Uh, so that's the main mechanic of the game. Um, you actually have boss battles. You have a uh, lot of different enemies, a lot of different ways to play. Uh, so you have the word warriors, which are like your main enemies. And they can also use the, uh, the power of the words to attack you. So um, this was a really exciting project for us. It was our first console game. Uh, it was released um, two years ago. That's Masamba, a lioness, uh, your companion. And that was us in 2017. 
Um, so we have been learning from that past uh, because talent and luck aren't enough. Uh, we're a small indie studio from Colombia. We've been around since 2009. I've been doing this for 10 years already. I know I look younger, which is not as good in this industry. People think that when you have uh, more gray hair, you have more experience. So that's not that good. Uh, but we grow with each game. And we have worked with a lot of brands, like a lot of international brands. So that gives us some credibility. Uh, so we work with Cartoon Network, Discovery Kids, uh, you know, they, some, some uh, very well-known um, companies. Um, but the most important thing that I can tell you is that we found our voice. And our voice was actually found with this little game. Uh, we did that in 2012, I think, 2011, actually. It's called Story Hero. And as you can see, it has the same mechanic as Heimrich. Uh, so we built it in like a week. It was an experimental gameplay project. Um, and we defined that our company was going to build very unique uh, type of mechanics for all of our games. So everyone was like, OK, so this is, this is great. You should build something bigger. So we built something a little bit bigger. And we published it on Congregate um, called Words Warrior. You can actually play it still. It has more than 300,000 players right now. I mean, people who have just, it's just 10 minutes. It's wonderful. And uh, it had really good reviews. But people complained it was too short, of course, because it was a proof of concept. Uh, then we decided to build a mobile version of it. Um, it was 2012. It was all the rage. Everyone thought the mobile uh, industry was going to take over the console industry. Uh, of course, that didn't happen. But you know, we were young, inexperienced, uh, had a lot of dreams. So we decided, hey, maybe we should hear the people that have experience. And we built a mobile game. And we built it for children uh, you know, of all the markets. Um, so it didn't do bad uh, at all. Uh, we were nominated for the Indicate in 2015. We won the Nickelodeon Kids Choice Awards. And uh, we were nominated for the International Mobile Gaming Awards in San Francisco as well. Uh, it was featured by Apple, more than 30 countries. But it didn't sell as good as we had hoped. Um, so it was really difficult to build that game for several reasons. One of the main reasons is that we don't understand that market. We're not that type of players. So we don't know uh, what that market is looking for. And when people play it, they actually enjoy it, but it's difficult to sell it to them. Um, then we built Heimrich, which I showed you. And it was a really well-received game. Um, it also won a bunch of awards. And uh, it was you know, uh, uh, very well received by a lot of people. In Europe, it was all the rage because you know, they really liked the gory humor. And that's also part of who we are. But the game was way too weird. And even if that sounds good, uh, a lesson that we've learned is that marketing unique games is not an easy task. So, some of you hi might have heard of this ad campaign called Now You're Thinking with Portals. Uh, so it was kind of well known around the world. Uh, you know, a little game called Portal um, did it. So if the game hadn't had that marketing campaign behind it, it wouldn't have sold nearly as many copies. Why? Because marketing a new type of game, a new type of mechanic, it's really difficult. People say they want innovation all the time. But to be honest, that's a buzzword. Nobody wants to something completely unfamiliar. People need something that hooks them up. People need something to feel familiarized with. Or you need like an incredibly big marketing campaign for, for it to tell them, hey, this is going to do well. Um, also, making unique games requires a lot of iteration. And iteration takes a lot of money. We're 20 people, and keeping a 20 people uh, running operation, it's expensive. So iterating on that month by month, it's really expensive, and there's never enough money. There's never enough resources. Um, and also, uh, if you remember Fairy Tales, it was beautiful, and it had great art style. But the thing is that we, when animation took two days to make, and it was around 10 seconds of a player. So 
the return of investment on that particular animation made no sense production-wise. Uh, so we usually overdo it because we think we're craftsmen, we think we're artists, so we want everything to look beautiful, but we didn't understand how limited the resources were. So we had to ship the game at the end, um, but without everything that we really wanted to push uh, into it. And finally, or or brand or name, we, we were used to call Below the Game, uh, which was a nice name, but it was actually a name uh, from an advert gaming company. So, you know, I don't know if any of you know what Below the Line is in advertising, but it's basically like um, guerrilla advertising. So, you know, uh, um, campaigns in malls and, you know, very different types of advertising. So we did it through games, so that's why Below the Game. Whatever, it's a whole process, and we didn't want to stick with that name, so we renamed it and we uh, created the, the new brand. Um, first, we have Sick, which is um, like the experimental part of the company. So those are Sebastian, Yadir, Carlos, and Camilo. I'm Carlos. Camilo's my brother. And we build like the weird stuff. Right? We uh, don't let uh, any limitation um, uh, hold us. We just experiment. But from all of the infrastructure that we had with Below the Game, we built Dreams Incorporated. And if you're wondering about the, the weird name, it's a weird explanation also. But um, has it ever happened to you that you're half asleep, half dreaming, and a fly goes through your ear, and maybe you're, you're uh, then uh, dreaming about an, a helicopter. So it's like, it's actually a psychology concept called Dreaming Corporation. So what I did, it's like, I want to get things out of my dreams and into reality. So that's why Dreams are incorporated. And now let's look at the interesting part, the present. We're trying to make the right game. So, um, we always start with a seed. We always start with that naked mechanic. We don't know what type of game we're making. We're just letting creativity flow. Uh, and we've, we're finding a unique art style. When I told the people uh, that I'm working with, uh, I want a game where you can actually see past, present, and future at the same time, um, they told me they wanted to smoke the same thing I was uh, smoking. So, uh, so no, it's actually something I want us to build. Um, Oh, I can't actually show. Uh, wait a minute. I wanted to show you like a part of the game, but I seem to can't. But whatever. It's, it's fine. Plan B then. Um, so we actually found the art style that we were looking for, um, and I hope you're able to to notice there. But as she walks from right to left, everything changes in real time. So the old lady in the past crystal, it's younger. Everything changes in this game. So you have three versions of everything. But then we're wondering, OK, so this is weird enough. We like it a lot. Uh, but how do we get in? How do we actually make a game out of this? So we started creating some limitations, and we wanted to put it into a, a very well-known genre. So people felt comfortable with RPGs, but more importantly, we felt comfortable with RPGs. Um, so it's always like a pincer attack on your, on your characters, but you have easily the future to the right and the past to your left. So you can actually see, uh, you can actually send your enemies into the future or into the past. Um, and that's how we put everything into a very familiar genre. So it's a familiar game. People know what it is. It's a turn-based RPG about time travel. That will get people's attention. But at the same time, it's not another uh, wannabe title. It's a very unique game where you see past, present, and future at the same time. So it's both an RPG for the nostalgic and for the new crowd. Um, we also created a, an art style that makes sense. So the animations are done frame by frame. Yes, we're that crazy. But um, 
since it's an RPG and you fight your enemies over and over, it makes sense because you see the same animations over and over again and people are used to it. People expect that. Um, so it improved the production uh, structure a lot. There were some limitations because, again, we're, we want to be artists and we want to make craft. So one of our dumb ideas was uh, we were so tired of making word games. We were making word games for like seven years. Uh, so we decided that we didn't want any words in the game. So we built pictograms to communicate everything. Um, that was a stupid idea. So we uh, scrapped that. And we put text, of course. So the game has text. But this is how the puzzles in the game work. So you have adventure mode, which is basically like, you know, travel from town to town, talk to people, solve uh, uh, quests. And you have time puzzles. So in the present, this is a very simple example, you have a busted uh, lock. In the past, uh, it's completely fine, but in the future, it's even more rusted. So what you do is you grab your little companion, Matthias, which is this little frog, and you send Matthias into the past with the key, and he opens the door in the past. So since it's open in the past, uh, it's open in the present now, right? And you can see a lot of those consequences um, immediately. So one thing that we don't have in real life is that our decisions are, you don't get to see what the consequences are of what you decide right now. Um, so if you make a bad decision, if you vote for the wrong politician, then you don't know what's gonna happen four years from now. But in this game, you actually do. So uh, this is a little example. Uh, it's not actually in the final game, but you can see a lake that's polluted in the future. So in, in um, the right side, you can see that the lake is very green, it's very polluted. Um, and if you talk to the people and you interact with all of them, uh, you can actually cleanse uh, the, um, the lake and make them decide, make them do other choices, make the people in the present do other choices. So you can see how in the future, everything changes and the future is completely different. It's pristine, it's clean. So your actions literally have immediate consequences that you can see. But that's not the only thing that we need to be aware of when we're building this game. So the characters, for instance, uh, they have to tell a story. It's like a webcomic. So for NPCs, you can tell a little story with past, present, and future. So, you know, a small child that gets to an old lady, um, a family that's, you know, growing uh, with time. But with enemies, it gets a lot more interesting because you can't have Pokemons. We don't want an enemy that just evolves. We have to have the same basic structure for an enemy, but he has to have different strengths and weaknesses. So an enemy um, in the past might be swifter, might be faster, might be harder to hit, but he will have lower power attack. Uh, in the future, he might actually become a magician and hit you with magic. And in the present, he might be a balance warrior. So you have different stats and different type of, of fighting styles against this enemy. Uh, that the, um, um, in, in, in the low part, you have our version of the slime. So it's basically like a, a devolution. Um, and you know it also has its strengths and weaknesses. So the little one might be easier to kill, but if you don't kill him fast enough, he can self-destruct and hurt all of your team. So you have a lot of different elements to balance out, so you don't actually have to uh, uh, fight an easier version of the enemy. It's like an easier strategy for each enemy, but you know it's basically three enemies in one. You also tell different type of stories. So I'm actually going to, to ask you later on if you think this is a good solution. So we're still thinking about how to solve a lot of the things that we, that we have. So as you can see, every, as you could see in, in the previous uh, um, GIFs, every character is in the same place in the past, in the present, or in the future. If there's like an old man in the future, he might not be there. So you might think, you know, he's dead and you're probably right but we needed to have a solution for when someone is not there, but it's not because he's dead, but because he left. So in this case, uh, so there's this girl who in the past learns magic, right? In the present, she's already a seasoned magi magician. But in the future, we wanted to show that she left 
uh, to learn more magic at a more advanced uh, uh, university. So what we did is that we put a little note that the little frog can actually read and tell you, hey, I left to this other place. Thank you for your help. Um, it's a solution we came up with. You will tell me later on if you think it's actually a good solution or not. Um, here you can see like how you actually send your enemies into the future or into the past. So uh, these ones are little Pokemons because they're like you know one of the few first few enemies of the game. So it's easier for people to understand. You have to like ease them up to see how the mechanics work. You activate the crystals during the RPG fights. But there are more complex enemies, like the Tricoon. So let's do an exercise. Um, in the present, you have a cocoon. It's absolutely harmless. Each turn, it will try to harden, harden itself, just like a Pokemon. Um, but it will basically do no damage. So what do you do? Let's say you attack him, right? If you attack him, he gives you basically no XP, no money. Just easy enough, right? But let's say you want to send them into a future to see what happens. If you send them into a future, this little guy might appear. You know, the little guy to the, uh, to the top uh, right side, if he appears and you kill him, you get a ton of XP and a ton of money. But that's only 50% chance. The other 50% is that this warrior appears. So if that warrior appears, she locks uh, the time version that she's in, and you have to fight her. And it's basically a mini boss fight. So this is our version of the mimic. So, you know, it's kind of like a treasure that you might want to open, you might not want to open, and it can give you a lot of experience, a lot of money, but it depends if you want to try your luck. The same thing happens with the past, of course. And there's other stuff that we want to build around or mechanics. Uh, so for instance, Super Mario RPG is one of our greatest inspirations, of course. We have timing mechanics, but also there's this um, particular status ailment that we love, that it's uh, the, the mushroom status ailment. I don't know if you tried it, but when you would turn into a mushroom, you could do nothing, but every turn you regained health. It's absolutely wonderful for Mario's lore. So we wanted to build something similar to that. Uh, the other image is from Bravery Default, in which you had another status element that blocked you from using uh, Bravely or Default. It's a really weird concept, but if any of you played Bravely Default, you can understand how bad it was uh, to, for you to not be able to use Bravely or the default system. So we created the time tricks. So this is our system. Um, in our game, you don't have, let's say, uh, enemy types. You have body types. So the enemies have different types of bodies. And um, why? Because we have the delta status elements. It's not a status element per se. It's a status, it's a status element that appears after you change a time in a status element. So just to make it more clear. Um, there's this enemy that has this really big ass shield. Uh, shield. So it's made out of metal, and we have the wet status ailment. So we throw the wet uh, magic to him. He gets wet, they get wet, and if you send the future crystal, so you send them into the future, they get rusted. So all of their defenses and offenses are weakened. Now you can attack and do a lot more damage. And you can only get to the rust by sending the wet status element into the future. So it, that's our delta status element. That's how we're creating this, uh, uh, this system. Um, you also have a lot of synergies between your characters. So this is Wilhelm. Um, Wilhelm uses plants. So this is uh, Yukandragora a little plant that if you send it to an enemy, it can explode and hurt just one enemy. But if you plant it, it needs a couple of turns to activate, unless you activate the future crystal. If you activate the future crystal, uh, it explodes and it does area of damage. 
so it hurts every enemy on that side of the screen. So this creates a lot of synergy between the, the characters that you have in your party. Um, so this is how we're creating those systems that allow you to experiment with the possibilities that we're giving you in the fights. We're getting a ton of help. Uh, so in the past, to build the prototypes, we had a lot of really good testers. Uh, James Furneau from Extra Credits, um, Jason Da Silva from Iron Hide, uh, Alex Mandrika, he worked on, on Rainbow Six and Iron Hunt. Uh, um, so there were a lot of people who helped us build the prototype. Um, and you know, perfect it so we could actually show it to publishers and uh, you know get enough funding for the game. Uh, in the present, we're working with really great people uh, like Mark Nelson, who's uh, one of the lead designers and writers from Fallout 3, Andrew Austin from Kingdoms of Amalur, um, David Bergantino and Jesus Lar. They also helping us with the story and the UX. And in the future, we're actually working. I mean, like you can actually hear their voices and their work in the in the current uh, demo of the game. Tyson Worley, which is the main composer of, um, of the music, which is absolutely beautiful. Uh, but we also have the main music of the town. It's uh, done by Noriki Norihiko Hivino, who is the composer of Metal Gear Solid 3, Snake Eater. Um, the voice of Chris Bell is actually done by Kira Buckland, who you might know from uh, 2B in Nier Automata. Um, and Derek, who's our main producer at Modus Games. So we are working with a lot of season developers uh, that are helping us bring this uh, jewel to you know, the massive audiences that we're looking for. And finally, another glimpse at the future, because we not only hope to sell a lot with this game, but we also hope to bring the Latin American uh, developers into the forefront of uh, media worldwide. So how are we trying to do that? Um, we're trying to create something called endemic fantasy. So endemic fantasy, it's a concept that we're creating in which you actually grab real elements from our everyday lives and turn them into fantasy. So uh, the cathedral that you saw previously, it's actually a real cathedral in Colombia called Las Lajas. It's a very gothic place and it doesn't seem to be uh, from Colombia, because that's what you know everyone has been taught. No, Colombia is not like this. Yes, Colombia is really magical. Uh, this is from Cartagena. Um, it's another place uh, that we're basing our, our uh, geography on. Uh, we have places like the Rainbow Lake, which is a lake that has seven different colors. Imagine a lake with seven different colors of water. That's straight out of a fairy tale. And we want to include all of those elements into our game. They are going to be, of course, uh, we have a cathedral made out of salt. It's a real cathedral. You can actually visit it in Colombia. So we want to grab all of these wonderful and really weird places and bring the magic out of them to show it to the world. But if you just see it, you don't think, oh, that must be Colombia. No, we don't want that. We don't want to be very obvious about it. We don't want to be like in your face about it. We just want people to just enjoy it. And uh, that's the way people dress in some parts of Colombia. But you know, we don't want to uh, be the cliche developer that does the indigenous people uh, because yes, that's part of who we are, but it's like 10% of who we are. We want to show a lot of the different places from Colombia. So you actually get to know a little bit of Colombia through this fantasy. So it's not only through the visual elements. Let's say you want to cure sleep. How are you going to cure sleep? With coffee. Like, it's something that we do in our everyday lives. Okay. Caffeine. Coffee sounds better for, a, for, a, for an item. Um, we want to start a movement like the magical realism did with the writers back in the 70s and the 80s, uh, with Gabriel Garcia Marquez and a lot of Latin American artists. Uh, literature is very much a part of who we are, but since gaming is becoming a part of who we, who we are, we are trying to develop a new movement with that. But it's only, again, from an aesthetics perspective. Let's say we want to build a mechanic out of it. Um, is there anyone from Colombia or from Latin America here? There's a few people, so you're going to understand this much easier than everyone else. You know what fiar is, right? Yeah, so fiar 
in Latin America, it's like when the people, when when the the guy at the store sells you something without you paying. It's like having credit, but you don't have to sign anything or nothing. You just tell him, hey, can I have this? Fiado? He's like, okay, you have to pay me tomorrow or the next week. Okay. Okay. And that's how we do it. That's real. And that's really much a part of who we are. Let's say we want to put that into a game mechanic. So you don't have enough money for a sword, so you can fiarla. So you have it, and you take it with you, free. But then if you come back to that store, you have to pay him, otherwise he won't sell you anything else. But you're like, doesn't matter, I'm going to go to other stores. But then the word spreads that you're not paying for the thing that you're fiat, uh, that you're that you have fiadas, then no one's going to sell you, or they're going to sell you uh, uh, at a much higher price. That's how you put a mechanic that's very ingrained in our culture into a game. By the way, that's going to be in the game. So we're also doing a lot of events uh, back in Bucaramanga. Bucaramanga is an 800,000 people city. Uh, it's a small city, it's still a city. So we're doing events like the Bucaramanga Game Quest. Uh, this year in May, we invited Rami Ismail from Lambert, uh, Luis Villegas from Bungie, uh, Randy Greenback from Gun Media, the guys that made Friday the 13th, and a lot of Latin American developers also to show people there that creating companies around games, it is possible. It is possible to make it in games from Latin America. And we do a lot of game jams. Um, so people get to actually experience what it is to create games. And uh, the, we did one like a month ago and guess what the theme was. Uh, we wanted people to actually start experiencing it. So the theme a uh, month ago was endemic fantasy. And you had to see uh, the really weird experiences that they built. So thank you very much. It's been wonderful having you here. I hope you had a good time. So um, it's open for questions now. So if you have a question, just raise your hand. I'll come and see. Sorry, my volume's not. Can you, can you hear me speak? All right. Um, so uh, th can you hear me? All right. Uh, so earlier you talked about the, um, well, sick games and dreams are incorporated. So as I understood it, uh, sick games, uh, kind of does more uh, R&D. You're a smaller team. And then uh, Dreams Incorporated is like the, the okay, so uh, how do you uh, synergize those two entities in the kind of a same game hub that you have? It's really difficult, but right now, um, what we're doing is that since Crystals was such a really important part of SIG, um, SIG Games became, became like the directors for the whole project. So let's say uh, Sebastian, who's uh, who created the art, is the art director for the whole project. So he's working, I mean, we're working at the same office and we are building like the same project. So it depends on project from project. So we sometimes want to build something smaller. So we go in a different direction. Uh, but, you know, like for the big infrastructure, uh, since Chris Sales became some, such a huge game, uh, you know, it's taking us around three years to build. Uh, so we needed every every hand that we could grab to, to, to build it. So. Hey, by the way, did you like the presentation? Did you like the game? Hope you did. Uh, yeah, it's not for an applause. It's just like, you know, it's just, just a hands up would be great. Thank you. <laughs> Well, just some question. I'll come after. Hi, 
Hi, yes, thank you for the great presentation. Um, it was definitely very uh, interesting to see. So uh, I was wondering at which point when you come up with the uh, unique ideas for the mechanics of the game, at which point do you use or test them? And um, like, is it at the ideation or is it after you have already developed it? And how do you do so? That's an absolutely uh, wonderful question because it's at the heart of what we are. <laughs> so we try to test them as soon as we can, you know, with sticks and balls, like uh, uh, you know, like the, the the smallest prototype that you can build. Uh, you saw Story Hero, right? That took us a week to build, and that prototype we put it on Congregate, we put it out there, we put it so people could actually play it. That uh, small prototype got around 70,000 people uh, playing it. So we knew we had something special. Same thing happened with, with Chris Tales. I mean, when we had the first prototype on it, uh, people went crazy about it. When I talked to people and I told them the idea, nobody got it. And everyone was like, this is a horrible idea. It will never work. And once we prototyped it, like I, I showed you like the little images that were, I mean, if, if I could uh, get to show you the prototype, I actually have it here, but if, you know, someone wants to see it, I can actually show it. Um, it's a very small prototype that you can build in a week or two. And if people play it and they get like surprised, pleasantly surprised at it, you have something special. So make it as fast as you can. Uh, and, you know, for the entrepreneurs who are here, it's like the same advice I give to everyone. You're going to mess up. That's a fact. Just mess up really fast so you can stand up and do it all over again. But each time, faster and better. And as Neil Gaiman says, um, as you become more experienced, you get luckier. Any more questions? Other questions, Jesse? Hi, thanks again for the talk. So earlier you mentioned about, you know, marketing for something with a unique gameplay or game mechanic is tricky and, and it's difficult. I was wondering if you could share some of the approaches that have worked for you or hasn't worked at all. So um, as I see it, there's basically two approaches. So one is when you have stupid, crazy money, such as Vault with Portal, uh, and you put the weird mechanic you know, in the front. It's like, this is new, this is incredible, this is wonderful, try it. But if you don't have that, like, or, or approach right now, I actually love it, which is, this is an indie love letter to classical RPGs. So people just see it because it's an RPG. It's a turn-based RPG. They know what they're expecting and they see the art and they like it. So it's like, you know, very familiar. We like it, we start seeing it. And I loved one review that we got um, that said, okay, so here's another beautifully drawn RPG, uh, another indie that's trying to capture the magic of the old classical RPGs. He started the review like that. And he was like, yeah, it's a cliche right now. But then he was like, and then the mechanic kicked in. And it's completely different. And it's something absolutely unique. So we have a hook that it's like a nice art. It's a well-known genre. It's, you know, well-made. The production value is, is good. But then you have like the real hook, which is like the main mechanic of the game. So people get surprised when you see it. It's like, you know, having a cheesecake. You know, you know what you're having when you ask a cheesecake? It's, it's nice, it's, you, know, you like it. But then when you taste it, it's something completely unique. And like the preparation of it, it surprises you. So that's kind of how we're approaching it with Chris Sales and people seem to be loving it so far. Hey, and, and if, I can, if I can ask you something, uh, uh, you know, before, you, before you leave, uh, we should take a selfie. Well, just some questions. Um, thanks for the presentation, by the way. So are you guys already thinking about a, a 
sequel to this game. Um, thank you for the great question. Yes, we are thinking about a sequel. Uh, actually, the game has done so well that uh, you know a lot of people have approached us telling us, hey, you need to make a series, an animated series out of this. You need to make plushies out of the little frog. You need to make a ton of stuff. Like, just you need to play it to, to experience it yourselves. Um, but since we're you know like in hell right now building the game as it is, uh, like right now I'm trying to see how everyone is doing back at the office because like trying to build this game for next year, it's very difficult because as you have seen, you know it's you have to build the same art three times. So in different versions, it's, it's crazy. Um, we have a ton of ideas that we're not going to put into the current game. So yes, hopefully there will be a sequel um, and it depends on how successful it is. But if any, uh, if there's any indication as how the game has been received so far, it, it seems to be like a, a, a very safe thing to say that we'll, we'll make a sequel out of this. I don't know, maybe we'll make sometimes, uh, uh, someday Chris Sales 15 or something. It will be an MMO. What's your self questions? Thank you. Thank you all very much uh, for attending the talk. Uh, if you have any more questions, I'm like through the whole event. And if you can just uh, uh, come closer so we can all take a selfie, that would be absolutely wonderful. Thank you.